Director Baum. In case my mom is watching, I want to be really clear. I'm not advocating for the legalization of marijuana. I will be very, very clear about that. However, I don't understand why it's a Schedule I. Um, it's certainly not uh, treated as a inherently dangerous substance for which there is no medicinal value. It takes a tractor trailer full of marijuana to even trigger a mandatory minimum under our drug laws. So is there any appetite for researching whether or not it should remain a Schedule I drug? Uh, Congressman, um, the, the administration doesn't have a position on that, uh, but I'm happy to dialogue with your office. And let me just briefly say that we strongly support research on medical use of marijuana. And if there are obstacles that we see that prevent good research, we want to address those obstacles. Because if there are component elements of marijuana uh, that could be put through the FDA process and turn into medicines that could help people in this country, we want to do that. So we do think there's some potential and we support research on the subject. Well, just so everyone's clear, methamphetamine is scheduled what? I believe it's scheduled two. two. Cocaine is scheduled what? Also two. Cocaine base is scheduled what? Uh, two. So it is scheduled lower than marijuana. And again, you can schedule something and still not have it scheduled as a one. And, uh, and, and I would encourage uh, the powers that be, whoever you need to consult with in the administration, to at least explore whether or not it's scheduled correctly uh, without being perceived as advocating for legalization. Understood. With that, Mr. Connolly, I will give you a chance to I'm reluctant to say whatever you want, but I'm going to give you a chance to, uh, <laughs> well, to I, conclude. I thank my friend, and I, I actually want to follow up, if I may, on, on what you just asked. So uh, the point being made here in some ways, Mr. Baum, is if you, not you personally, if, if, if the government, federal government, on this subject, marijuana and how dangerous it is, has no credibility because of the lack of serious empirical work, it threatens our whole drug policy's credibility. And you're seeing this happen on marijuana in the states. They're, they're making decisions. Ms. Norton talked about eight states, but there are over 25 states that have in some fashion, including my home state of Virginia, liberalized their laws for medical reasons all the way to recreational reasons. You, I think you'd have to confess to the chairman's point, there was no empirical evidence to justify putting marijuana 50 years ago as a Schedule I drug. Who did that empirical evidence? Sorry, could you repeat that? Who, who did what? Who made it Schedule I? There was no, um, I am asserting, and yes. you can feel free to try to contradict, there was, in fact, no empirical evidence to justify putting marijuana ahead of the drugs the chairman just listed as a Schedule I drug. 50 years ago. And I would, so you, you brought up the need to have empirical research before we start rushing pell-mell uh, to approve it for medical purposes, and I agree with you. But here's the problem, as I said in my opening statement. Only one federal entity, NIDA, controls marijuana for legal purposes for experimentation, testing, and the like, research. And NIDA's mission is all about proving the harms of something. They have a priori determined the outcome of research. Nobody thinks NIDA is an objective, neutral place to go to look at the good, the bad, and the indifferent about marijuana. It doesn't have that credibility. So if we're gonna do what you suggest, we need to have a different entity with credibility where we're looking at objective evidence and science. And then we can determine, well, where does marijuana work? Mr. Humphreys made the point that there's a more lethal uh, or stronger, more fortified uh, versions of marijuana coming out that concern us. But we put a lot of people in jail, and we've treated this like it's more dangerous than cocaine and the other substances the chairman, and, and it's had huge consequences based on very little scientific evidence. I'm not arguing for the legalization either. I agree with my friend from South Carolina. I'm not going there. But neither can I justify the current policy of treating it as the world's most dangerous drug with its classification. 
you can feel free to respond, and I'm done. Congressman, I, I, I understand the point that you're making. I would love to go with you in your district to talk to police, uh, police chiefs and sheriffs. I think in reality on the street, uh, police, sheriffs, they don't treat marijuana the way they treat heroin and fentanyl. Uh, so I think in practice, uh, there is a prioritization of the most deadly drug threats. Uh, I, I think I actually think that's his point, um, is that law enforcement doesn't, our sentencing scheme does not. Um, methamphetamine and marijuana are not treated the same from a sentencing standpoint, but yet marijuana is considered to be inherently dangerous with no medicinal value, therefore a Schedule One, And it, it would just be helpful, again, to Mr. Connolly's point, for us to have some consistency or at least be able to explain uh, why certain drugs are, are Scheduled One and, and others are not. And um, you know, we can save that for, for another day. And again, that's coming from two people that are not advocating for the legalization, um, just for some common sense in how it's scheduled. Um, on behalf of all the members, I want to thank all of our uh, witnesses for... Thank the gentleman. We'll recognize the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Gowdy, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Terry and Mr. Heyer, I want to begin by expressing our condolences and sympathies um, ongoing for uh, the loss of your son, Special Agent Terry. And I want to ask you a question in, in, in just a moment, but Special Agent Dobson, I, there was a franticness, an obsessiveness exhibited by federal law enforcement officers with respect to narcotics, uh, controlled delivery of pornography, uh, even money, uh, which um, is not inherently dangerous as, as firearms and, and narcotics and pornography would be th this obsessiveness, this franticness of never letting that walk. So that would be um, only intensified if you were working with firearms. From the very first moment I heard about Fast and Furious, I, I, it has vexed me how anyone could have ever thought this investigative scheme was going to work. I, I don't know how a line agent would think it was going to work, and that's why line agents have supervisors and assistant U.S. attorneys and U.S. attorneys to say, wait, your heart might be in the right place, but this may be the dumbest idea I have ever heard. How did this investigative scheme get started? Who, who thought it was ever going to work? Well, sir, I can tell you, I. I I can't tell you where the idea originated from or who is ultimately responsible for beginning it. But apparently, or what I can tell you directly is everyone in my chain of command, up to and including the former director, was well briefed on the case, well versed on it, and knew the strategy coming and going. And they all thought it was a great idea. The U.S. Attorney's Office in Arizona, as well as up to Maine Justice, were briefed on it. You, you yourself know the requirements of big cases or big problems and the briefings you have to go all the way to OEO, the Office of Enforcement Operations, to do some of the techniques involved in the investigation that we were doing, the OSADEF funding that we had, the proposals that were written for that. It was all spelled out, sir. Everyone knew it. It was there in black and white. And I always thought as soon as we got to the next level, somebody's going to shut it down. As soon as they hear about it, it's going to get shut down. But it, that never happened. It kept getting more funding, more approval, more attaboys. Uh, the people were, that were running it were called to D.C. several times to brief it at headquarters, at uh, special operations divisions, and over at Maine Justice. And it just seemed it, it was the new, the new strategy. All the rule, rule books that you and I are aware of were thrown out. I worked with DEA for a number of years. We were never allowed to walk dope, not a gram of it. And walking money was, we would have to go and work a case through a county to get approval to that. DEA would not authorize it. So when I heard that we were walking guns, it was completely alien to me. Well, I'm glad to hear that because it's alien to me too. I, I cannot imagine letting someone that you even suspect to be a straw purchaser purchase a firearm and then let that firearm uh, navigate its way through uh, the criminal element only to be recovered at a crime scene. I, I, I just I find it unfathomable that anyone could ever have thought this would turn out any differently than with the mother of a slain federal law enforcement agent and or ordinary citizen sitting at a table. I, I, I honestly, I have tried to give the benefit. I actually like 
federal law enforcement officers. I'm probably biased towards them. I'm just struggling to understand how this ever could have turned out any other way. As soon as the gun leaves the parking lot, unless you're maintaining constant surveillance, then you've lost the gun. And then if it crosses the border, God knows what you're going to do with it. And, and, and then when you learn they didn't even let our Mexican counterparts in law enforcement know what was going on, I, this is the most eminently predictable uh, tragedy that I've been connected with since I've been in Congress. It could not have turned out any other way. Um, Ms. Terry, I want to ask you one question, and then I will have a very brief conversation with the chairman. For lots of America, um, they view your son as a hero, but all they have seen is a still photograph of a young man in uniform. What would you like our fellow citizens to know about your son that they may not know? Brian was, he was like a special, special person. He was dedicated, he was a true American. He was just dedicated to his country. He loved, he loved being in the limelight. He loved helping people, protecting people. And that's what he always wanted to do. Well, thank you. He, um, he was wired differently, the different uniforms that he wore. Uh, most of us are not wired uh, to want to run towards danger. Um, most of us are wired to protect ourselves first and foremost and not others. So you raised an outstanding human being, and I know that I uh, hope that that provides some level of comfort to you even in the throes of your grief. Uh, in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, I would just say this. Um, Perhaps I have missed something. I thought the administration said that they were not part of the approval and were not part of the process and had nothing to do with this investigative scheme. So I guess I'm vexed in how you can use a defense of deliberative process if you were not part of the process. And I would encourage you to share this report with the chairman of the subcommittee that provides appropriations for the Department of Justice. His name is John Culbertson from Texas, and I would encourage you to share this report for this reason. We all have privileges and rights, um, and all across America, every day people waive those privileges and rights because there's an incentive to waive them. Um, I would give DOJ an incentive to waive their privilege, and I might do it through the subcommittee chair on appropriations. Thank the gentleman.